good morning everybody here in Europe. Good evening for all of you who are on the east or far east and maybe good night for some of you who were brave enough to wake up in the United States. Uh, welcome to the second session of the workshop uh, Working with Nature for Climate Resilience, Sport and Waterways. As I see this, uh, the, this, is, I, this is actually a, a one seminar we divide in two parts. Session one was uh, yesterday, was chaired by, by Victor Magar at Rumble, and session two is, is this morning in Europe. Uh, my name is Luca Sittoni. Um, I share my time between uh, uh, Deltares and EcoShape, Building with Nature in the Netherlands, and uh, uh, other organizations, including Pianc. And together with Victor, the chair of yesterday's session, uh, we chair also the working group uh, on uh, beneficial sediment use. Um, as I mentioned, this is really the second session of, of the same webinar. Uh, we are we try, uh, given the, the interest on this topic, to uh, to really cover uh, the globe. And so we decided to have one session last um, yesterday afternoon for for those who are in Europe, and another session this morning to try to catch up all the different zones. Um, this in this uh, in this workshop. We touch on different topics uh, that are very important to finally um, making working with nature in a climate climate changing world uh, mainstream as part of real policy with, 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 with real financing. Yesterday we spoke about scaling up and changing in trench current practice. And today uh, we are going to continue making a bridge to how to make the business case and securing finance to, uh, to cover uh, the, the, this, uh, these projects. Um, I won't go in a lot of introduction. Victor gave a good introduction yesterday. If you wish to see the session one again, uh, the event is being recorded. The event is recorded also this morning, and you can see on the on the PNC website. Um, what we have today for the next two hours, that's the that's the the, the plan for for today. We have uh, seven speakers line up. You see them already uh, in, uh, in the webcam. I will introduce one by one um, in a minute as, as you go. Uh, we will go with the uh, uh, presentation one after the other. We try to be uh, rather brief. We have 15, about 15 minutes for, for the keynote speaker and then 10 minutes for uh, all other presentation. And we want to uh, try to, to keep that concise because we do want to reserve some time for question and discussion at the end. Uh, you will see on the um, on the menu bar there's a there's a possibility for you to ask question in the chat function. Uh, please do ask question. You won't see them uh, from the audience we will see them from the organizer. So it, it does seem like no one is asking questions, but that's not the case. They come in to us. Uh, yesterday, we had uh, some great questions we can ask at the end, and we really would like to use that uh, for the discussion. Um, please all mute your uh, your microphone. It's it's impossible to, uh, to, to with, with so many participants, to give you uh, the floor, unfortunately, but please do send questions. Um, again, the program of today, uh, we, we, we start with our keynote speaker, Peter van Eyck. He will uh, serve, let's say, as a bridge from the session of yesterday and session of today. We will then have a couple of interesting presentations on, um, on ecosystem services and how to, to help make a business case with ecosystem services. Uh, uh, and then a few applications, Ports of Australia, who will uh, show us how they actually uh, implemented that and then we're going to transition to uh, how to secure finance and how to finance uh, infrastructure with uh, uh, finishing with uh, with um, insurance company Swiss Re, Eric from Swiss Re and I think it's a really nice transition from the technical discussion we had yesterday into the finance who came at the table yesterday already into having uh, uh, other private sector who are interested in helping us uh, mainstreaming, helping us more technical people mainstreaming this uh, type of sustainable solution. So I do look forward for a very interesting um, workshop to conclude the session of yesterday or to, to add to the session of yesterday. And with that, I won't take too much more time for introduction. I'd like to uh, introduce um, our keynote speaker, Peter van Eyck. Uh, Peter. 
Peter is the head of the Deltas and Coast program within Wetland International in the Netherlands. Wetland International is also part of EcoShape, so Peter is almost a colleague of mine when we work in EcoShape projects, and he will uh, um, talk to us about mainstreaming building with nature in Asia, overcoming bar barriers, and le leverage investment. So, an excellent bridge between the two sessions. Floor is yours, Peter. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Luca. And yes, indeed, in this presentation, I would like to connect what was discussed yesterday. Uh, the approach of bringing nature-based uh, solutions to scale and what we will be discussing today, the market-based mechanisms that you can develop to actually bring nature-based solutions into the mainstream of engineering. And in the last few years, um, within Wetlands International, together with a number of partners from the uh, EcoShape Consortium, we've been on a journey where we started very small and are now making plans to bring nature-based solutions into the mainstream in Asia. And I would like to share uh, this journey uh, with you because I think there's quite a lot we can learn from that in terms of identifying approaches to bring nature-based solutions to scale. I would like to bring you to uh, this uh, severely degraded coastal area in the north coast of uh, Java, an area called Dumak near Samarang. And as you can see from the image, uh, this is an area that is in severe trouble. More than 70,000 people are about to lose their livelihoods, their land, their houses as a result of severe erosion that is caused by land subsidence, as a result of water extraction, the development of unsustainable infrastructures that have been disturbing the sediment balance, and also the decline of important protective coastal ecosystems, such as, for example, mangrove forests. Huge income loss, huge assets at stake, huge problems. So initially, the Indonesian government worked with hard infrastructure solutions to curb some of these challenges, but that wasn't very successful. Many of the dikes that were constructed in this area literally sank down into the mud and, uh, as you can imagine, only worsened the problem. So together with a number of partners from the EcoShape Consortium, Wetlands International has worked with local stakeholders, communities, but also government representatives to develop an integrated nature-based approach to solving these challenges. As you can see on this uh, image, we have applied a number of engineering measures, such as permeable dams, nine kilometers in total, that uh, were trapping the sediments along the coastline and in a way restored the sediment balance in order to uh, al allow mangroves to settle again in this vulnerable area and once again take over the protection. But we also worked in the hinterlands. As part of our integrated approach, we explored opportunities to work with local communities to change the way they were doing their aquaculture and agriculture practices, introducing organic shrimp farming approaches, and also looking at issues such as uh, deep well water extraction, an important root cause of the uh, subsidence that was happening in the area. And now, uh, yeah, five years down the line, uh, yeah, we see that uh, along around 20 kilometers of coastline, we have managed to actually stop a lot of the erosion processes. We've managed to boost income of local people, and it has shown that our integrated approach is successful and that indeed the combination of ecosystem restoration, sustainable land use and engineering pays off. That uh, was seen by our government partners, not just those who we work with in the field, but also at the national scale. And we were invited to, on the basis of our lessons learned, help integrate green solutions in uh, designs for harbors and urban areas. And yeah, we worked in uh, the last five years on several designs uh, to bring nature-based solutions in uh, engineering practice. We did that on the basis of concrete cases, such as this uh, vision for harbor development in Samarang that we developed, but we also worked with the government to support policy development and build awareness through trainings. So we asked ourselves the question, considering that we were quite successful in moving from a very small project to a rather sizable project, what can we do actually to bring this approach to scale across Asia? And we brought a bunch of about 60 people from international organizations and people from Asia together to ask this question. Together we brainstormed and we developed the bold vision that we wanted to try and accelerate climate change adaptation in Asia by really achieving a paradigm shift in water engineering and ensure large scale adoption and integration of nature-based solutions into engineering practice. We identified that with a 10 years time horizon, we wanted to 
to reach that by promoting the development of what we call climate resilient landscapes, selected sites in which we drive the implementation of nature-based solutions following the EcoShape Building with Nature approach. Our immediate aim is to achieve an impact by leveraging investment uh, through the markets, and we have a target to leverage at least 2 billion euros in a few years' time for uh, funding these different landscape projects. And ultimately, our aim is that we want to make 30 million people more resilient. We take that in a step-by-step -step approach. So we are currently building out a grant-based program that puts in place the conditions that will ultimately ensure investment through the market. So what we discussed uh, during the workshop was how can we get there? How can we materialize this bold vision and achieve these goals? And we relied on a number of the lessons that were learned by several innovation programs, including the work by the EcoShape Consortium, the work by the US Army Corps Engineer and Piank, and of course also the experiences from the field in our own projects. We identified enabling conditions that need to be put in place and reviewed those, but of course also looked at the dozens of nature-based solutions that we've been testing in dozens of projects across the world. And on the basis of that, it was uh, concluded that what would really help is to, in the pre-competitive domain, do a number of things that cannot be done by the market. To, at the regional scale, develop an overarching program that puts in place the enabling conditions for adopting nature-based solutions. This includes building knowledge and capacities through dedicated centralized trainings that can be shared amongst countries. It could also be through assessing policies and opportunities for financing and creating incentives with finance institutions for nature-based solutions and communicating about the different projects and thereby creating awareness and buy-in. The thinking being that if we would organize across our five target countries in Asia, these activities at a regional scale, the countries individually can take the knowledge, the tools and the information to actually work within their specific country context to create an enabling environment for building with nature. So this is very much a top-down process. We also decided to develop the program as much as possible bottom-up by identifying a number of sites in our target countries where we know there is an immediate need for the development of infrastructure for solving challenges related to flooding, erosion, or meeting goals related to development, such as a navigation infrastructure, for example. We decided to identify a number of sites where we know there is a need for investment and development, and where we would then, rather than focusing on just uh, pr proposing a great solution, develop an integrated solution. So for dozens of sites in the region, we started working on what we call landscape propositions. On the basis of an assessment of the functioning of the wider systems in each of those landscapes, we visualized the problems, the challenges that we observe in those areas, but also started visioning different nature-based solutions that could be integrated as part of the solution. And these images are just some examples of what uh, our, our visualizations look like. There's information about challenges visualized in our landscape proposition, also about solutions, but we've also been mapping out the dynamics in terms of the stakeholders and their interests within the wider landscape and started looking at different scenarios. What would it cost if you follow a business as usual scenario versus investing in building with nature type solutions? What are the upfront costs, but also the long-term costs and benefits? monetary benefits, but of course also the wider societal benefits that are derived. We are currently working really hard to materialize this program. It is a work in progress. We are trying to find the funds for implementing it. We are trying to design uh, the program itself, identifying work packages to deliver on this ambition, and also uh, developing the governance for the initiative, including identifying political partners, but also implementing partners in the region. We try to do that as much as possible through a consultative process. So in the next year, there will be dozens of consultations in the region, but also at the global scale to shape this initiative. Learning from the past and from our current implementation, we think there are a number of ingredients to success to make building with nature or nature-based solutions uh, reach the mainstream. We very strongly believe in the need for a phased approach where you start small with a pilot, bring, the, bring that pilot to scale, and subsequently use the model of scaling up 
um, as a basis for replication elsewhere, stimulating similar bottom-up processes essentially across the world. We also strongly believe in the need for a multi-scalar approach. The fact that it's very valuable to develop flagship initiatives on the ground that demonstrate best practice and cause inspiration, but also the need to work at the national scale on supporting enabling policies, but also working regionally or even globally to inform and inspire action. This needs very strong ownership by government partners who drive action from the region, uh, but it also uh, requires finding an approach to reply to demand. So if we use urgency as a lever for action, it might be much more easy uh, to promote nature-based solutions. And with that, I mean promoting these solutions in areas where we know there is a need to solve a certain challenge or where there is a willingness to invest. Co-creation is important. So building with nature in Asia, we will ensure that as much as possible, it's locally led. And we will adopt multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary approaches to come to truly integrated solutions. And lastly, while we very strongly believe in the power of the market to uh, bring nature-based solutions to scale and bring together the multi-billion investments that ultimately will be needed, we also realize that there is a need for grant-based programming where actually the things that cannot be done by the market, for example, creating this enabling environment can be adopted. This is the approach we will be taking. Um, we are kind of halfway in moving from small scale pilot to full scale mainstreaming. And we would be very keen to continue exchanging also with you to uh, learn your lessons and, uh, and see how we can work together towards these goals. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Excellent, excellent presentation with uh, quite a few keywords that uh, hopefully will inspire us during this workshop, climate, big scale, urgency, financing. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. Um, you. And with that, I'd like to remind you to please send us questions. They're coming in, they keep coming in, and, um, and we, uh, I'd like to go to the next, next speaker. Uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Sabine Appitz. Bina is the director of the uh, CEA Environment Decision in the UK. Sabina will talk to us about applying the ecosystem service concept to waterborne infra transport infrastructure. Also inspired uh, from the from the recently um, issued PIANC uh, Working Group Report 195. Thank you, Sabina. Over to you. Thank you. Hello. Good. Today, I'm going to speak to you about how to apply ecosystem service concepts to waterborne transport infrastructure projects and how this will help you build a business case for more sustainable and resilient projects. Let's get this going. It's there. Human well being is completely dependent upon ecosystem services, the goods and services we get from a functioning ecosystem. However, ecosystems functioning or not also provide disservices or things we do not want. We manage land and waterscapes to optimize the services we value. This may enhance priority services, but may also deliver or enhance disservices in place or on other spatial or temporal scales. Service-based assessment and assessment focus on other classifications of human value can underlie and support decision making by identifying these interconnected risks, benefits, and trade-offs. A lot of what we have historically done in project design is risk management. To do this, we ask a series of questions focused on risk. Given the answers to these questions, we consider prevention, avoidance, preparedness, and restoration measures. Sustainability thinking looks at it from another perspective. What do we want? In this case, the questions focus on goals. Using these questions, we then seek to manage systems to optimize the benefits whilst minimizing undesirable impact. Clearly, these are different sides of the same coin. But if you start by thinking about where you want to go, you can optimize outcomes. Ecosystem framing helps us understand the links between our desires, 
or the services and the risks they pose or the disservices. Water transport infrastructure projects impact services outside their remit, but they are also dependent upon services to sustainably and resiliently function. Considering impacts of projects can help identify and avoid undesirable impacts, such as impacts on fisheries. It can also identify win-win opportunities, such as habitat enhancement or carbon sequestration that can be added to a project design, creating value. This can help facilitate stakeholder outreach and acceptance. And it can help integrate a project within broader regional, ecological, regulatory, and socioeconomic objectives. WTI is also, however, deeply affected by services such as water flow and purification, siltation control, and storm protection. Evaluating current and future service provision can thus identify vulnerabilities to climate or technology-induced changes, helping ensure resilience planning. It also provides a framing which shows us when working, building, or engineering with nature optimally captures those services to most efficiently implement WTI objectives. Thus, a service-focused evaluation looks at desirable and undesirable impacts to both the project and the larger environment to optimize environmental, social, and economic outcomes. The WTI project cycle has a number of phases from initial concept design and optimization through construction, operation, and maintenance, and ending with decommissioning or adaptation. We can use ecosystem service framing throughout our project cycle, first to determine what our objectives are for a site and a watershed, then the articulation of our vision and desires for the project and region define our sustainable conceptual site or catchment model, which underlies future works and evolves as we learn. Ecosystem service concepts can reflect the expectations and impacts that can underlie planning, considering the trade-offs and seeking to optimize services and minimize disservices. Different types of ecosystem service assessment are used to move through the project cycle. Baseline assessment lets us know where we are starting from and determine what our objectives are. Prospective assessment predicts the service impacts and trade-offs from various design strategies, optimizing projects. Monitoring is used to track predicted ecosystem service changes. Retrospective assessment evaluates if services were impacted. Adaptive assessment is a focused prospective assessment looking to identify adaptation and mitigation strategies if services are undesirably impacted or if objectives change. ESA can be decisive seeking to identify the optimal design alternatives. It can be technical seeking to determine how impacts can be mitigated or compensated either with measures or payments or it can be informative, being used to advocate, justify, or communicate the effects of decisions rather than to make a decision itself. In any case, ESA can be qualitative, looking at positive or negative impacts without detailed quantification. It can be quantitative, looking at impacts in measurable terms, such as cubic meters of water purified or hectares of habitat or changes can be translated in terms of monetary or non-monetary values. Assessments should only be as complex as needed to address the question at hand. At times, simply identifying potential impacts will be enough. At others, quantitative or even monetary information will be required. How are service concepts used to make the business case? We examined a number of case studies. ESA played a different role in each case and affected different parts of the project cycle. The devil is in the details, but briefly, legislation-driven inclusion of natural and social impacts optimized compensation and mitigation. 
monetization of natural capital showed the value of enhanced protection. Post hoc benefit monetization will inform future design. Monetary societal cost benefit analysis identified the highest net benefit design. ESA identified design impacts for mitigation. Historical service surveys engage stakeholders in new strategies. Multi-criteria assessment of ecosystem services or use values of alternatives optimize stakeholder values and expectations. And studies of blue carbon impacts seek to monetize climate benefits. Overall, an examination of the full range of services gained and lost due to WTI projects helped ensure projects delivered greater value to project owners, the environment, and the broader community. To summarize, the ES concept is applicable to large and small WTI projects in developed and in developing countries. It is most beneficial from the beginning but can provide utility at any time. ES framing has a number of benefits. It helps evaluate the WTI project in the broader context, identifying opportunities and avoiding undesirable impacts and risks. It provides a transparent basis for communication to a diverse range of stakeholders, enhancing community support. It facilitates decision-making. It bridges sustainability, working with nature, and climate change framings. Ecosystem service assessments build a business case by identifying and amplifying benefits and avoiding vulnerabilities. It defines and captures non-traditional values and costs. Further, this framing feeds into emerging sustainability approaches, supporting frameworks such as sustainable blue economy, environmental, social, and, go and corporate governance, and principles of responsible investment. I'd encourage you to have a look at the PIANC report and to feel free to contact me or any of my co-authors if you have any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you for the excellent overview of ecosystem services. And I think the next couple of presentations will go a bit more in details on the project example uh, where this, this framework is being used. And with this, first a word to Colin Scott. Colin is associate and at ABP Mayor in UK, and he will have a very interesting title, How to Waste Less of Our Waste. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to the uh, Piank and, and navigating, navigating a changing climate workshop. Um, uh, as Luca says, my name is Colin Scott. I work for a marine consultancy in the UK uh, called ABP Mer, and I specialize in coastal habitat creation and restoration work. It's a field that I focus on because I think it's vitally important, but also even playing the smallest role in trying to restore coastal habitats is a very fulfilling thing, as I'm sure many of you will know and understand. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is the progress we are making in the UK with trying to use dredge sediment to restore our declining intertidal habitats. So the situation in the UK, as things stand, is, is, is similar to what is happening in much of the rest of the world. Every year, we have to dredge something like 20 million meters cubed of sediment to maintain our ports and harbors. For those that can visualize it, that's about, that would, that would fill Wembley Stadium in London five times over every year. So that's a lot of sediment, and that gets placed at offshore disposal sites, um, unconfined locations. Of course, at the same time, our habitats are deteriorating, particularly on our south and east coasts. And so for, for years, we have been challenged with how do we get even some of that sediment onto some of those marshes to try and protect and preserve them. Now, this has exercised many, many people for many years. There are studies going back decades, and I've just I highlighted a few here that are, that, are, that are relevant and recent. I won't go into detail about them, but I'll point out the two on the bottom row on the bottom right hand side. The Piank study of 2009 um, 
that was a really useful study that was that was produced you know, over a decade ago now, and that's just about to be updated with a new study that the Pianc Environmental Commission Working Group 214 is just producing, and that's a detailed, thorough international review, which I think will be a very helpful going forward in trying to, to in, in trying to identify how projects can be delivered in the future. And the other one on the bottom right hand side, that's a new handbook that we've just been created in the UK specifically designed to guide people on how they might use dredge sediment to restore and protect coastal habitats. Again, it's for the UK and, and it has some international examples within it, but I do hope that that will be an inspiration and, and a help to anybody across the globe who wants to do this kind of work. So what all of these studies have told us over all of these years is, is one simple message. It is complex. It is complex to suddenly take sediment that you've been placing offshore for years and start trying to place it onto salt marshes to do some good. There are technical challenges. You could have new bits of equipment, new vessels, you have new consenting arrangements. The regulatory process can be very, very painful. And of course, extra costs. And even, even just getting a basic consensus about whether it's a sensible thing to do can be difficult. There are some nature conservation bodies in the UK who think they're a bit sort of concerned about putting sediment on marshes and whether they can tolerate it. And to some degree, that's because we haven't been very good over the years in explaining the successes and monitoring the effectiveness of projects that we have done. And we have done quite a lot of small scale projects of various techniques, but I don't think we've been very good at communicating them. We even have a problem with just the basics of having the information needed to make decisions. So who's dredging what, where, how, and when can take quite a lot of effort to identify. You have to dig through the regulatory consent documents or engage in a long consultation process, which, which can, can, can just you know, not be helpful when you want that information quickly to make decisions. But the thing for me that I exercises me the most is we're not very clear on what things cost. How much, how much does it cost to take sediment offshore? And how much would it cost to change that practice and start putting it somewhere else? And until we can get a handle on this, we're never going to be able to properly communicate across stakeholder groups about what's the art of the possible, what can be done in different areas. If you don't know how much things cost, you can't communicate about what you're asking people to do or what can be done. So I think that's very important. But in the UK, we are trying to change this story. In, re in recent years, uh, there's been a lot more work done on trying to understand how to strategically identify beneficial use sites in advance so that we can see that, see that they're available and work out how we can use sediment to, to enhance marshes that way. One of the examples of this, one of the perhaps best examples is this is down on the Solent, uh, where, where, where we are at the moment, where our, our offices are. In the Solent, on the south coast of, the, uh, of England, we have a million meters cubed every year gets dredged and put offshore. Whereas we also have marshes, some of them, that are eroding really rapidly and will be gone by the middle of the century. And that's not very far away. Um, so the situation in the Solent echoes the situation in the country, echoes the situation globally in many ways. And the local coastal partnership Solent Forum has engaged with us and ABP Mer in a process of trying to understand how we can change the way of doing things in the Solent. And that, you know, the, the, as uh, going back to Peter's point, this has to be done in a phased way. This can't be done in a quick and simple way. And so we started a few years ago with phase one. And phase one was just working out what we know. Where is the dredging? Where does it go? Who's dredging what? And what, the, what are the volumes? But also we created an online data viewer, which you can interrogate to identify where the best locations are to put this sediment. Where are the locations with the most vulnerable coastal defenses or the most vulnerable flood sensitive hinterlands or the areas where the habitats have eroded the most? And then we had workshops to discuss with people and stakeholders with their views based on their local knowledge of, of, of what, they, what was on their doorstep to identify what sites could be taken forward. So that was phase one. And that identified a site in the west of the Solent, west of the Solent, where the, where the marshes really are eroding, two or three meters a year on their outer faces, and they're also decaying, decaying ecologically. They will be gone by the middle of the century, and they're also protecting important harbors and, and, and populations. 
So this is where the most benefits come. If we can focus on this, this is where the most chance we have of making a beneficial project work. So then we went into phase two and we looked at all the different options that you might apply to a location like this, large scale projects or small scale initiatives. And we did something I think that's relatively unique and that we collated a lot of information about, again, how the thing that's most important to me, which is how much these things cost from a large scale, over a million pound project to small scale, tens of thousands of pounds of projects. So we looked at that and we compared their benefits using, as Sabina has just shown, the ecosystem service approach. So what's the nat using natural capital accounting, what, what are the benefits of each of these different scales of option? Uh, whether that's whether that's carbon, trapping carbon, or flood protection, or recreational value, or biodiversity value, all of those. And what we found actually was the large scheme, the one that costs over a million pounds, probably won't be beneficial. It, you know, it won't be won't have a greater benefit than its actual cost, which is interesting. But what was really encouraging was anything that was medium or small scale did have benefits that outweighed the cost, and it made the case for us quite clearly that we need to progress very. very progress with a medium or small scale project going forward and to try and do some, do some initiatives on these marshes to try and protect them in the next few years. And, th and there have been several recent projects in, in that area already, small scale, that have been providing valuable lessons about, again, how much things cost, how much does it cost to take it offshore, how much extra was it to put it on the marshes, and then how much does that cost reduce over time by doing regular activity. And so the next phase we're going through, and we're in phase three now, is we are currently seeking consents to deliver projects at the at this location. So we're going to get the consent for it. We're going to identify some specific actions, get consent for it, and and you know, and and hopefully in in the next few years start to be building out from one or two projects and getting bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Again, coming back to what Peter was saying, getting a phased approach, starting small, and getting more and more confident over time as we go go forward. So by way of summary, these are the key points that are emerging from the process. We've benefited a lot from having strategic planning and partnership building from this project, but it has to be done at a local level, just national plans on their own, telling you broadly what your what, the, what ambitions might be for biodiversity enhancement are not going to be good enough. We have to have local initiatives led, led locally with partnerships, people who know the environment on their doorstep. We need to move to a position where we identify a range of possible sites which will be beneficial and assessing those benefits based on their ecosystem services and then licensing those sites so that they can be deposit grants. So you don't just have deposit grants offshore, you have beneficial use sites that are much more available and useful and, and usable. So we have going forward a pipeline of foreseeable and future projects. And we need to use this strategic framework that we've built to better understand costs, benefits, and who benefits. And then if we know who benefits, then we can start to think about funding more. And again, the regulatory process is always challenging, but there are initiatives in play in this country to try and understand how the regulatory process can be made a bit more efficient and transparent. There's no, you can't sidestep it, it has to be tackled, you have to have one, but there are ways in which it can be made more efficient. And I, I do think that fundamental to all of this is communicating the lessons of projects, communicating the successes of what went before so you can make the next project better. I know you would think we can do that, but we still aren't very good at doing that. We aren't very good at monitoring projects and then clearly communicating those findings to the betterment of future initiatives. So fundamentally, all of this, the aspirations for the future for me are we need much more learning by much more doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin. Excellent presentation. So less waste and much more learning. Uh, and thank you also for pointing out the PNC report we are we're also working on together and uh, for with your with your great contribution so it's, it's good to see some practical experience coming back to help us inspiring us um, with that um, i go to the next speaker we move all the way from uk to australia next speaker is uh, gordon Dwayne. gordon is environment project principal at the gladstone port corporation and gordon will uh, 
talk to us about the practical case studies about sea world habitat enhancement using working with nature concept within the port. Um, and I believe, Gordon, that your web webcam is not working yet, but uh, we hear you well, I think. <coughs> Welcome, Gordon. Hopefully you can hear me and might be good my webcam isn't working, but good evening from Australia. Um, so a practical example from our side of the world is that some seawall habitat enhancement that we've um, been looking into. Um, but I suppose first step for us is really where we are. Um, we're in central Queensland, um, so the port of Gladstone is what we, we are talking about. But we're one of three ports that um, Gladstone Ports Corporation own. We have about 50 kilometers of channel, um, 20 berths, about, or well, usually about 2,000, maybe 1,800 vessels a year and over 120 million tons in a nutshell. We live in a, a, a bit of a macro tidal estuary system um, with a couple of smaller rivers coming in, but it's mainly driven by tides, winds, and waves. And this project, we did done some of the beneficial reuse uh, material, but this really was to try and get an understanding of the habitats in our area that it was suitable for enhancing on the seawall in particular. Um, and that could be existing ones proposed or future ones and whether with um, sea level rise and such like, whether how we can defend those with working with nature solutions. Uh, you know, we usually use seawalls for making uh, land for large dredging projects. And then secondary was obviously a viability of creating that habitat and what that might look like. So to start with, we um, sort of some numerical modeling, um, knowing that where we've put seawalls in before, that the flow increases. And what we needed to know was uh, what the fine sediment resuspension threshold was um, and, and make sure we could reduce that flow. So we either place the sediment there, dredge material, um, and then there's also an accumulation if we've got those flows correct. So the modeling looked at some groins at 150 meters or 350 meters apart, just to try and uh, gauge a, a realistic way of, of trapping sediment. So then we looked at the uh, keystone ecosystem forming species uh, in our area. So it wasn't just things that uh, are in there. What are the habitat forming species that give us a good biodiversity? Uh, and the key ones there, I don't know how well that shows up really, we've got the, the mangroves, the grey and the red in particular, being colonising species, the oyster reefs, um, sitting with the rock oyster and the, the mangrove one in particular. And then we've got the Zostra and the Halophila seagrasses in our part of the world where um, the, the, the key um, ecosystem forming species that we took further on and, and had a look at a little bit more. And as far as the design goes, we needed to try and find what uh, the optimum height, if we're going to place in, in any material for one of these habitats, what should it be and why? And this particular example is uh, for the mangroves, looking at uh, distribution and inundation. The, the bottom line on the graph shows the elevation, so where it's relatively flat, it's, it's got green dots in there showing that it's suitable for mangroves. But the, the line starting from the top is inundation per um, minutes per day. So as you can see, that's fairly red when we've got only a, a, a one meter of elevation. So there's a bit of a sweet spot there for mangroves around the 400 minutes a day in our part of the world um, that uh, was targeted and therefore about mean sea level for us is where we would um, put um, the material and, and the groin height, whether it should be at the same as our sea walls or whether it was just the same level um, as the, the material that we might put in there. And that was the secondary option. Moving on to mangroves was the first one that's ruled out that we go in natural recruitment versus facilitated um, as far as sort of research goes. And the secondary thing was, do you put oyster gabions at the bottom, knowing that those flows that you saw earlier um, would erode and scour out the base of any sediment that we placed there? Um, so would you get a... Uh, that secondary benefit by either building a wall or introducing oyster gabions for uh, sort of co-location. Oysters themselves, the 
the oyster bags are used relatively commonly, uh, certainly in Australia and around the world for the Sydney rock oyster. And now, uh, so as I said, so that'll be gabions or some of the concrete um, solutions you can see there. But when it comes to the mangrove oyster, that would need seeding. The variable heights you can see there in the design is if you if you put at the mean sea level, as I mentioned, you will get mangroves. But if we wanted to try and make some seagrass along areas of that, we, we want to put uh, probably sandy material and keep it below the mean sea level, um, make it an, a decent intertidal area at the right height. Just an example of what we could do with at 350 meters in the lower diagram, you would see some of the scours, so you wouldn't put the material all the way out without protecting it. Whereas the 150 meters groin separation, you could um, just protect at the ends with seeding of various oysters. As I mentioned just before, depending on the height of material you put behind the wall is whether you could focus and target seagrass or mangrove habitat. Now, they don't really like uh, co-locating too much. It's probably seagrass and oysters or mangrove and oysters. This is the trial that we're looking at um, doing very soon. So we're going to use uh, putting the groins in their little yellow boxes for using a, what we call blue stone, a hard rock that doesn't deteriorate in the marine environment, but with limestone and gabions at the tips. Uh, the mangrove um, trial will be in the larger round circle top left, timber boxes, uh, sediment boxes that can uh, assess natural versus transplanted in our part of the world, and then oysters, as I mentioned, on the tips of the groins, but also um, some tiles and some gabion baskets. Um, there's some concrete structures just in front of the pipes. You can see in the small round circle, um, again, top left. And part of the, the information that we don't know is co-location benefits, and that's what we would try to achieve from that. But as has already been discussed today, we wanted to try and work out, can you normalize habitats and, and, and have a meaningful discussion about what is um, the value of each habitat, whether it's money or, or not? Uh, and and we, we went down the economic route, had a look at the direct or indirect uses, you know, direct being fishing, harvesting, recreation, the indirect ones um, in, more in the provisioning of a biological support service, the non-use might be altruistic or, um, or just the existence of a species for future generations. Can you put values against those? The ecosystem services that we've, we've also had presented, we've got the supporting ones, of course, like photosynthesis and provisioning of food and resources, the regulating water quality or climate and cultural, uh, in our part of the world, spiritual or aesthetic or a recreational education in, in wider meaning of the word. The table there shows you um, whether I thought it had a significant, very simple box of simple, moderate or low contribution um, to ecosystem services, but whether it was uh, came from and, and the scale and confidence we had in the source of that information. That then moved into a, a value benefit transfer, which is a staged process. Um, so really set a framework, make sure you understand the source uh, studies, transfer methods, and then have you got enough to do any of the sensitive analysis uh, once, you, once you've done that transfer. And again, coming back to what we've looked at in our part of the world, the seagrass came in at about $12,000 uh, a hectare, mangroves at you know, just under 12, and then oysters at 35, putting that into a, um, a, a bit of a graph, really just to understand where they sit, um, uh, value versus um, ecosystem contribution scores. is what I've tried to do there. It's, um, so it still leaves a lot of questions. Are they com comparable? There's a very large spread of values for what these things um, are, are done. It was, an, it was a, a literature review done around the world for oyster reefs and mangrove and anything that had an economic value done in, in papers. So that's, um, suppose, what we've got. Can we use that in a, a, a cost-benefit analysis? Well, we have to try. Um, then the, the, the co-location is a question that we want to try and answer. If you put, um, it, you know, obviously in, in the environment, we do get these things living together. So what is that as a value? And can we get the ecologists back involved to uh, look at some of those numbers, even if it is just um, 
and central Queensland specific. So the funding and the approvals, uh, as touched on in a previous uh, tour, we've got internal and external um, approvers. So we've got our obviously management and board and we are state owned entity. But um, on top of that, we've got our conditions that were applied in any of the permits by the federal or the state agencies, which can cause some challenges. Um, and then of course, customers and community um, approval is very important for uh, a lot of ports living um, close to the water with um, fairly big communities around you. So trying to do a bit of a cost benefit analysis with the data we've got so far, um, that is, so seagrass comes in at somewhere between a, 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 the return on investment of eight to 28 years and some very round numbers. The difference being seagrass without dredge sediment um, in an area that just needed um, seeding or uh, proper gules, then that would be around the eight year if we need to place dredge sediment there, depending on the method of dredging. That's where you, you start getting some big costs. The mangroves, high because I've presumed there we need to put sediment there to get the mangroves growing where they're not already, so it would be a high cost. The oyster, very rubbery number because I've just shaken the price of a, a gabion basket and half a cubic meter of oyster shells and multiply that by 10,000 to give you a hectare number. Um, that's not how you would do it in reality, but it was just to show a scale. They are worth a lot according to our uh, habitat value, but they cost a lot to put in place. So the benefits to us and selling this to um, the relevant agencies internally really is we are enhancing habitat, which helps with our social license. If we are developing further the existing and future offsets, it helps with the discussion, what is the best habitat to be putting uh, in these areas and just have a, an informed discussion. The value add being, as I alluded to earlier, there are some challenging policies in our part of the world. So having some good robust science that sits behind what you might want to submit to a policy review um, can only help. And as I said, social license is always important for uh, reports. And that, I think, is probably me time up. Just acknowledgements there for my the, the co-authors and the citation that a lot of this information comes from. Thank you, Gordon. I'm losing my headset here. Thank you, Gordon. Um, also, excellent presentation. What I like here, um, I like that we are really going to uh, real projects. Eh? We see real projects example. We see concepts, and then and then we have. Uh, some of you showing us that you're really using this concept and, and we are making progress, we're learning from them. So really thank you for that. And um, with intention to be more sustainable and to save some, um, some emissions, we, we do stay in Australia with the next speaker. Um, um, I, before we, we fly back to Europe, um, I'd like to invite Craig Wilson. Craig is an env environmental manager at the Port of Brisbane, Australia. And he will give us another case studies example about off-site stormwater solutions and a, an innovative way to, to do sediment management. Thank you, Craig. Word to you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, um, Luca, and thank you everyone for um, attending today. I'll present on a, um, a initiative we've come up with, um, I guess driven a little bit by the um, working with nature concepts, um, impacts of climate change on the port, and I guess a, a better financial solution um, to result in both uh, community and environmental benefits. Um, so the Port of Brisbane itself, um, we are a private port. We were privatised by the state government in um, 2010 and we're owned by four uh, global infrastructure investment companies. Um, the port itself is located um, just down the road from um, Gladstone where Gordon is um, in Queensland. Uh, we are um, the capital city of Queensland. Um, port of Brisbane itself is the uh, third largest container port uh, in Australia um, and we are a multi-commodity uh, port, um, predominantly containers but, but uh, handle a variety of cargoes. Uh, port of Brisbane Proprietary Limited itself is responsible for managing um, the land at the port and the 90 kilometre uh, shipping channel through Moreton Bay um, out in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the port itself is a river port. Um, the port was, was historically located upstream um, 
in Brisbane River are close to the city. In 1978, the port was moved down to the mouth of the river and through a series of reclamation um, processes, um, the port as you see it today has been developed. I think just looking at this aerial before I get further into my presentation, I'm just noting um, a lot of the land uses at the port, um, a lot of sealed uh, cargo storage areas. So fairly um, clean port in terms of what we're handling. A um, lot of containers, a lot of cars, um, a lot of general storage on um, good quality hard stand. And in terms of our um, ecological value at the port, we're located in quite a, um, a sensitive environmental area. We abut the um, oh, that's not meant to happen. We abut the um, Morton Bay. Oh, I don't know what's going on here. We abut the Morton Bay uh, Marine Park boundary, and we have um, a num number of sensitive environmental areas close to the port. A lot of mangroves. Um, intertidal flats with seagrass. Um, we get a lot of international shorebirds coming and roosting um, both on port land and adjacent to the port. And we're also in close proximity um, to the community. So um, in terms of our project and stormwater management in general, um, in Queensland, there's a policy um, around planning and development. And in that policy, you're required to treat stormwater to um, certain levels, which is 80% reduction in TSS, 60% um, reduction in um, total phosphorus, 45% reduction in total nitrogen, and 90% 90, 90 reduction in gross pollutants. And typically and historically, um, that treatment has been done at the source, so on site, using um, stormwater treatment methods such as um, soft infrastructure, bioretention basins, um, and swales and grass swales and things like that, or hard engineering infrastructure, um, big in-ground um, treatment systems, et cetera. Um, what we found at the port um, in looking at that is it's quite expensive to install that infrastructure for a very small um, environmental benefit. Um, so what we did is we we looked at the, um, the stormwater policy and within that policy, it does allow you to um, treat that stormwater uh, alternatively. So you don't have to put in those on-site um, structures, you can treat it off-site. And that um, is essentially what we latched onto and thought, well, okay, we're spending heaps of money to um, to treat this stormwater on-site. Um, surely there's, there's a better way we can spend our money to get um, better outcomes. Um, so what we did then is we looked at um, the cost, the actual costs of what it was to um, what it was costing the port to install these on-site treatment systems. And we looked at um, seven um, recent projects at the port that had, oh, I don't know what's doing that. Um, seven recent projects, oh, sorry about that. Seven recent projects at the port. Um, that, um, that had, had on-site uh, stormwater treatment. And what we found, we were spending in the order of about $30,000 to $110,000 per hectare to treat that stormwater through those on-site treatment mechanisms. And that was averaging out about um, $50,000 um, per um, hectare to treat stormwater on-site. We then undertook some research to look at the amount of sediment that we were treating. And um, that, was, that was done through rainfall simulation across a number of our sites. And on average, we were treating about 1.15 1.15 tonnes of sediment per hectare. So we're spending about $50,000 to treat 1.15 tonnes of hectare per sediment a year. We thought, well, okay, rather than doing that, let's collect money from our developers and um, and look at look at those offsite um, treatment options. So we said, well, let's set a levy that's attractive to developers, less than what they're spending, so that there's higher take up and we can generate a significant amount of money um, to, to invest um, off-site. At the same time, and, and this is where the climate change impacts come in, we should stop doing that. At the same time, um, we had two major floods um, in Brisbane River um, in 2011 and 2013, and we had significant amount of sediments coming down um, the Brisbane River that impacted the port itself with our, with our dredging. Um, we typically dredge around 300,000 cubic metres a year. 
across those four flood years, um, we were dredging over a million cubic metres of fine sediment a year. So there was a massive problem somewhere in the catchment where we were getting heaps of sediment. We did a study that replicated a 1970 study, and you can see on the right there, and the, the 2015 study showed that there was significant more fine sediment um, in Moreton Bay than what there was in 1970. So where was this sediment coming from? Um, from historical research, we'd found that um, there was significant um, impacts on streams and gullies up um, predominantly in the rural catchments of the Brisbane River, where they'd um, in the past uh, cleared a lot of vegetation off those creeks and straightened them to get the water off the landscape. And this had resulted in highly erodible um, streams and gullies up in, the, in those rural catchments. So, we got to this point where we knew we were spending $50,000 a year to put these on-site treatments in place, and we were treating 1.14 tonnes um, a year for that investment. We knew that there was this big um, sediment problem um, upstream, so we said, well, let's have a levy, $30,000 a hectare, um, and let's go and spend that money and see um, what we can do up in the encatchment to improve that, to try and reduce some of this sediment coming down the Brisbane River. So we worked with a, a huge number of stakeholders, um, local and state governments, um, NGOs, um, universities. So that there was a, a big working group established um, that we went through a process to run a pilot to see what we could achieve. And it was a fairly simple concept. So uh, as you saw in those previous photos, you've got that near vertical banks. Basically, the process was to, to go up there lay those banks back on a nice stable angle, angle and you can see the process in those photos there, um, then add some vegetation for surfness roughness and that was essentially it. So we took uh, uh, half a million dollars of money and went up and treated a kilometre length of bank um, up in the upper Brisbane River catchment. Um, and then we underpinned that work by science. So we'd done that work and we wanted to try and demonstrate um, the linkages of that sediment to the bay and how much sediment we would treat. So we did three phases of science. The first one was looking at the amount of sediment that we'd save um, coming out of the bank by doing the works. Um, the second piece, piece of science was linking where we're doing the works down to the port to show there was equivalence. And the third set of works was some geochemistry works just to verify that the sediments at the port were actually coming um, from the areas that we treated. And all that work clearly demonstrated um, that the works we were doing in the catchment was treating a significant amount of sediment that was eventually making its way down to the port. So I guess through that process, um, what we found was um, that, yes, there was um, significant benefit in, um, in undertaking the offsite stormwater treatment. And now, um, since that pilot, we've de developed We've delivered four projects, about $3 million worth of investment. That's treated about, 40, that's now treating about 14,000 tonnes of sediment per year. So stopping that sediment coming down um, to the Brisbane River to the port. Um, significant water quality improvements, so both environmental improvements, that sediment's not getting into the system, and drinking water quality. So our drinking water quality is treated in the Brisbane River, less sediments, obviously cheaper for that water utility. Um, the stream bank ecological function, so adding that vegetation, improving the streams, the flow, um, much better benefit. Also land resilience, so a lot of where these creeks are, are on farmland, we've added resilience to that farmland and where we've delivered them in urban environments, there's a lot of community values. And here's just a short video. If you look on the right, this is where we've treated. If you look on the right is an untreated bank opposite the works we've done. You can see heavy erosion. This is during a, a high flow event. On the left, you can see the bank that we've treated, um, which is held up nicely, is actually trapping sediment. So you look on the right there, heavy erosion, then as the drone switches over to the left, you can see that bank laid back, you can actually see deposition along there. So it's worked really, really well and is trapping that sediment. Um, at the same time, we're still treating those pollutants on the port. So we're, we're still putting in um, treatment systems, I'll, I'll obviously a lot lower cost, but we're finding that we're still getting sediment in these. So not only are we treating the sediment we should have been treating at the port, we're still capturing sediment through on-site treatment systems. Um, so just in summary, a really, really good example, I suppose, of, of based on what the previous speakers have spoken about, uh, uh, of how coming up with innovative funding mechanism, using the working with nature concept to come up with a project where we're actually delivering, delivering really good environmental benefits at, at a lower cost. And you can see in that table on the, 
on the left there. If we would have done that treatment on site, we would have spent $5 million and we'd be saving about 115 tonnes a year. We took that money, invested in the catchment, we got all those secondary benefits and we're stopping 14,000 tonnes of sediment a year coming down the river. So the dollar per tonne there is, is, is astronomically different. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, also another very inspiring uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to underline a lesson learned here that I, I got from it, and that's a system-based thinking. That's also important. You, you mentioned in the in a, in a catchment, um, catchment basin, and indeed, uh, when we work with nature, it's very important to, to look at system-based, not just the port or what's behind it, how the system works, and indeed try to work with stakeholders to connect supply and demand. That's, that's a lesson learned we, are, we really try to, to, to apply, and, and if you do that, it becomes cheaper. I was, I was also very happy with this, with this example, in addition to the ecosystem benefits used we, we saw in the previous presentation. So, so thank you again for that. Um, now, um, as I promised, we are going to fly back to, to Europe now. And I think we're going to also change a little bit in the last, uh, uh, let's say, part of this, uh, of this workshop and this, uh, and this uh, session. Um, we touch a little bit about scale up. You saw in the previous presentation and yesterday. Uh, then we went into business case, especially in relation to how you can use ecosystem services to improve your business case. And now we're going to go into finance. Now that we got all this fantastic business case and good ways that we, we could, we could, we could uh, make a project worth, it's time to look how can we pay for it. And the next two speakers will uh, um, explain a bit more how and what's needed. And with that, I see Arjan um, ready for his presentation. Arjan Hydra is a managing director at Vital Port, Vital Port and he will talk to us about uh, financing sustainable marine and freshwater infrastructure, also with reference to ongoing working group at PIANC, working group 230, for which you are like, you, I think you're going to try to get more people to help, with you, help you with this, uh, this working group that just started. Thank you. Thank you, Arjan, word to you. Well, thank you, uh, Luca. Well, happy to be here. Um, actually, this is a... Oh. It's a combined presentation, but it suddenly drops from my screen. So let's see if I can get it back. Where did it go? Okay. Um, this is a combined uh, presentation. Um, I'll uh, show a little bit about the general, uh, I'll provide a general overview of the finance side of things. And then Eric Payen from Swiss Re will dive deeper into one of the uh, uh, financial instruments that can be used to actually uh, get these kind of projects working. So in a nutshell, I will fly through some uh, big headlines, uh, as you're probably aware of. Uh, there's quite a lot of news about uh, the uh, green investments, green finance. I'll show a bit of the financial landscape and then we dive deeper into the uh, practice, uh, specifically into the practice of waterborne uh, projects. And then I'll end, uh, as uh, Luca already mentioned, uh, with some further guidance uh, amongst that also the PNC working group uh, on this. So first and for all, just some big headlines to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's going on. Uh, uh, the presentation is called Work in Progress, and actually it's a very dynamic field. Uh, as you are probably uh, in Europe, you're all aware about the Green Deal. Uh, a lot of money from the uh, European Commission that will be invested in uh, uh, green projects. Uh, but similar things are happening uh, on the other side of the Atlantic at, uh, in the US. Uh, new infrastructure bill, which is also linked to uh, climate goals. But it's not only the public side, uh, as uh, the uh, private side uh, as well is moving and getting vocal. Uh, the ESG investors uh, also mentioned uh, after the uh, new climate report came out that they have to uh, gear up their efforts. Going a little bit to Asia, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, earlier this year they announced they're going to boost the financing for green projects projects and this all seems to be uh, good news but there's also quite some uh, discussion 
uh, as you see on the lower right hand side uh, about what may actually be uh, called green and uh, quite some discussion or even uh, investigation on uh, investigations on greenwashing of uh, investments so calling it green while well, in fact it may not carry that name so let's um this brings me to uh well the uh overview and infographic on uh green investments uh, well you, you can uh, segment uh, uh, this field and there's a uh, well you cannot talk about one type of investment there are many types and in this picture you can see on the left hand side let's call this traditional investment general investments for infrastructure in general uh, and if you want want to get to the more more sustainable side of things uh, you see in, step, in steps you can go all the way to the more philanthropic side of things where uh, return on investment is not actually playing a big role but uh, they just want to see uh, uh, effects uh, and impact in real life on uh, sustainability targets <clears throat> and the many steps in between these kind of uh, different types of investing come with different uh, financial instruments which is shown in the bottom half uh, this is a little bit of a uh, a general loose uh, linkage to these uh, types of investments but uh, you can imagine that uh, some of the instruments can also be used for uh, uh, interchangeably um, again this is a bit about the uh, of this is about the uh, private side of things uh, obviously as already shown in some of the other presentations uh, quite often uh, investments also come from uh, the, the public side uh, national governments, regional governments, uh, public ports. Uh, but then again, these can also be uh, combined with uh, private investments to leverage actually uh, the total amount of money that can be invested. And this is called blended finance. Um, then perhaps one remark, there's a bit of a difference between green finance and green projects. Suppose if you have a really, uh, nice uh, green project and it brings uh, good market returns then uh, other uh, all kinds of investors will be interested to step into this uh, so that can be traditional investors as well uh, because well they see a good opportunity to get a return on their investment so that's something to keep in mind green finance is not the same as green projects So suppose you're an investor and you're interested to invest in a green project. So what would you actually be looking for? And these are a few criteria coming from uh, early publication by uh, the World Wildlife Fund on bankable nature solutions. Um, and in a nutshell, well, you would be looking for uh, first and for all positive environmental returns. And I'll get back to that in a moment. What are actually uh, positive environmental returns? Um, you'd like to see uh, cash flow generating activities. Of course, if you put money in it, eh, you would like to see how you're going to earn this money back. Uh, you would probably be very interested in a high probability of success, um, but also a clear exit strategy. If you put your money into that, how are you going to get your money out of it? Or how are you going to sell your share? And how are you uh, going to be enabled to invest in the next project? So you have to be able to get out as well then of course eh, there are many opportunities or many ways of investing your money so you'd like to see from a particular project an acceptable risk adjusted rate of return and particularly if you're talking about the, uh, the more sustainable uh, infrastructure investments or even uh, working with nature or uh, nature-based solution kind of uh, projects uh, these often may come with some uncertainty, for instance, in the uh, performance. So de-risking the uncertainties is something this, that is uh, uh, of great importance. And Eric Payen will dive deeper into this as well. And what would be really helpful would uh, uh, be a clear proof of concept and proven track record. And this is perhaps a little bit of a paradox in the waterborne infrastructure sector, because, well, the good thing of all kind of initiatives that are taken uh, in, in, in the past uh, time is that projects tend to be highly context specific and that's a very good thing uh, taking into account all the 
the elements that that, that play out in, in a specific uh, area. But then again, it's difficult to see how such uh, uh, projects would uh, prove to be successful in a different setting as well. Uh, in that sense, projects uh, can be difficult to compare, which is difficult to build an actual uh, track record uh, which builds confidence in uh, by investors because they all see the same thing happening time uh, and time again, uh, and time and time again, they see it as being successful. Then, as I mentioned, I would come back what is actually a, a, a green or a positive environmental return. Quite some uh, instruments are uh, at play at this moment or under development. For instance, in the financial sector, here you see the uh, uh, ESG criteria, which stands for environment, social and good governance uh, criteria. So then you can score an investment on, uh, on sustainability. But also in Europe, you have the uh, SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. So you have to report, it's a, a mandatory report on the, on the profile of the investment. And coming up uh, quite soon will uh, be the uh, European Union taxonomy, which actually determines what projects can be called green, what projects are eligible for uh, funding from the, uh, uh, from the Green Deal, uh, uh, for funding from the European Investment Bank, but also what private investments are uh, enabled to call themselves green and are eligible for you know, kind of... Uh, beneficial uh, taxation regulations, for instance. So a little bit, uh, uh, one slide on, on, on the, the business cases. Uh, traditionally, you see, uh, you're trying to build revenues from uh, by serving a certain type of user and having ki all kinds of externalities around the area. Uh, with the, the newer type of projects, uh, with the green projects, you try to build uh, a, a more, more sustainable model, providing a lot more value to the uh, society as a whole but then comes in play uh, or particularly important is the way how you're going to capture that value and build cash flows from that so value capturing instruments are very important and you've seen some examples already in the earlier presentations today well diving in just a little bit deeper into that as well uh, suppose hey, you're talking about a port in a, a coastal region um, wetlands, mangroves, reefs, seagrasses might provide uh, coastal stability and dissipate wave energy, important for port areas, but these can also deliver additional ecosystem services. Uh, but as said, if you apply these, uh, you would like to see predictable cash flow. So de-risking the uncertainties, for instance, uh, the performance in reality, uh, long term, that would be something uh, to focus on. Uh, and again, uh, Eric will dive deeper into that. Then, as said, 10 minutes is way too short to cover it all, but I'd like to bring under your attention the upcoming report on financing sustainable marine and freshwater infrastructure. It will come out next week, the official launch. Also, it will be picked up by the World Economic Forum. And this was a joint publication by the International Association of Dredging Companies, the Central Dredging Association, Vital Ports, my own company, uh, Swiss Re, uh, and B Capital uh, Partners. Uh, Eric was also one of the uh, authors of uh, this report jointly with uh, quite a lot of other uh, authors. There are nine cases uh, also described in this, including the financial structure. So I highly recommend uh, reading this if you're interested in the topic. And then as Luca already mentioned, uh, we are working hard on a PNC report on the same topic as well. It is, uh, we aim to provide uh, practical guidance uh, pointing towards various other publications. Uh, but, um, well, we can need uh, help in uh, getting this done. So if you're interested to join in, please uh, let us know. So if you want to receive the report, don't hesitate to contact me. And if you're interested to join the uh, working group 230, also on uh, finance of green projects, don't hesitate to contact me. And with that, well, I'll hand it over to Luca again. Thank you, Arjen. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, and thank you also for mentioning the big international ambitions and things are happening in Europe, but not only in Europe, but especially all in Europe, as far as I know, as well, with a taxonomy, which will likely determine what we're going to do in the future and how we're going to spend our money. So thank you very much. Um, and here, the last speaker, um, Eric Payen. Um, Eric is a senior client manager infrastructure and disasters risk finance for Swiss Re. 
um, and uh, he will uh, talk to us about the role and needs of the insurance sector. And I uh, very much welcome you, Eric, and thank you for joining for a new sector we need we need to uh, invite more often to this to this workshop and more and more, uh, more often work together. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. Do you see my screen? Yes. Uh, you, you probably sh you want to adjust your microphone. I think it's a bit far from your remote. Yes, Perfect. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Perfect. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, to be here and to speak today in front of you. Uh, let me introduce myself very quickly. My name is Eric Payen. I work uh, at uh, at Swiss Re. It's a larger insurance company based in Switzerland with a, a turnover of uh, 40 billion euro per year, and it's uh, we're 160 years old. Um, I'm part of the public sector solutions team, and uh, our our mandate is to create uh, innovative uh, insurance solutions to support the government and more broadly the the public entities across the world on their resilience journey. I think that Ariane in the presentation and the other presenters have really set the scene. I mean, the financial world is going green, really. Uh, there is a real momentum. ESG standards are, are not any more um, a nice to have. Uh, there is a wide range of uh, financial structures that, that can accommodate significant amounts uh, of investments. And also the good news is that green solutions exist. You've been talking about it, technically available. They just need a, a conducive approach to be deployed. So if I go to my next slide. Um, so today, um, I'd like to introduce you with a case. Um, it's a zoom on a specific example. Uh, of uh, the world's first parametric insurance cover for coral reef, which we implemented in Quintana Roo. Um, it shows what can be done, for instance, to prepare the case for investments. Ayan mentioned the fact that investors don't really like when cash flows are not too stable. So um, that's a way to facilitate the public and the private funding for nature-based climate change adaptation and resiliency projects. Uh, Quintana Roo, for the one who have not been into this beautiful place, uh, is a state in Mexico. It goes from uh, Cancun to, to Chetumal on the Mexican East Coast, and uh, it hosts some of the most beautiful coral reefs on the planet. Uh, in Quintana Roo, the public and the private stakeholders, we talked a lot about that already previously, um, so by that I mean the state of Quintana Roo, the local municipalities, the hotel associations, because it's a very touristic place, the NGOs got convinced that natural assets uh, have a value worth protecting for the service they provide. I think that that's the first thing we need to be convinced as stakeholders about the value of such kind of assets. Um, but let me first uh, talk, I mean, in that respect, about the example of uh, coral reefs and the coral reefs benefits, because that was the first thing that uh, the Nature Conservancy, who worked also on that, uh, that project together with the Rockefeller Foundation, did. They looked at a comprehensive value. So uh, when we start about coral reef, um, coral reefs reduce over 90% of wave energy during storms by protecting the shoreline. Uh, it has value. The reefs also reduce locally 60% of the wave energy under normal conditions protecting beaches from erosion. So that were really studies made on the site. If uh, reefs are degraded, a uh, loss to infrastructure caused by a storm could triple. And uh, a report in two uh, 2019 uh, from the Nature Conservancy together with the Institute of Marine Science from the UCLA estimated, for instance, that uh, the hurricane protection um, afforded by the Mesoamerican reef, so that's the reef that goes along this coast, um, during two, uh, the hurricane Dean, for the one who still remember, uh, prevented the damage to the buildings by 42 million USD and to the hotel infrastructure by 20 million. In a shell, what does it mean? It means that um, it's equivalent to a damage reduction attenuation of 43% in that case. And uh, last but not least, uh, Quintana Roo generates 10 billion economy in tourism activity. So the coral reefs are the most attractive uh, and most important attraction. So as I said earlier, all of these um, economic reasons were um, a strong enough case to decide to finance the coral reef itself. So um, to represent how it got fine, so to represent the different stakeholders, the Quintana Roo gov uh, government established the trust, a trust, um, 
for coastal zone management to secure the long-term funding, which is mainly done by the government, but also some additional tax, uh, taxes on tourism. So what uh, finances the trust? It finances uh, three essential activities, the permanent maintenance and conservation of the beaches and coral reef. Um, it uh, finances the economic losses from the most frequent but less severe tropical cyclone events. And for the very severe, and it finances the, the, the premium of parametric insurance, and we'll come to that, for the most severe hurricane events. So the insurance payouts then are used to pay for the coral reef rescue activities, the beach sand erosion uh, recovery, et cetera, the debris removal. So now um, the first policy was written in 2019. It was um, a first in the world. Um, so the trust buys the insurance on behalf of the state of Quintana Roo, and um, it is a beneficiary of the policy. And then it uses the money for the different uh, purposes that I mentioned before. Um, to give you a few numbers, the cover allows for a maximum limit uh, of 2.2 million USD. So that's the overall, the total maximum payout that the insurance company would give. And the payout have been dimensioned uh, through a lot of studies to consider the short and the medium term financial needs to restore the reef. So now let's see the, the key features which are um, explained here in this, uh, in this slide that, uh, that you can see. So what is a parametric insurance? Uh, it's an insurance which triggers a payout based on pre-agreed parameters. And there in, you see three uh, elements, three parameters that had to be defined. First, it's uh, the wind speed, that's the parameter, and the threshold that would trigger the insurance. Uh, then you need to have, uh, so the wind speed, you can see it uh, on that side, so that's a function, so above 150 miles per hour, 150, uh, 15, sorry, 149 and 184. Um, so these are the functions that have been studied to show depending on how much it degrades the corals. So it really makes sense above these, the, to, to pay, to take an insurance above such kind of wind speed. Uh, then you need uh, to define a geographic area where the measurement of uh, the parameter must be met by the threshold to trigger a payout. So this is what you see on that side. Um, it took a while to really define um, the, the box or the polygon uh, that where the, if there is a tropical cyclone and wind, wind speed that are measured into this box, then the insurance payout. And then you need to define a payout increase according to the maximum sustained wind speed. This is uh, because stronger wind speed uh, result in greater damages and expenses. And you see that uh, here, the percentage of payment. So let's say like for 1 million, if you have like 40%, then for a speed, wind speed of 150 mi 15 miles, then you would only receive 40% of that 1 million. And for the maximum wind speed, then you would receive 100% of this payout. So in very simple terms, as you can see on that slide, um, if the storm goes and wind with the right wind speed into the defined area, then there's a payout. If it passes outside, then there is no payout. Quite simple, uh, but takes a lot of uh, uh, know-how to, to model that. Um, so now, just like um, very, uh, the, there was a proven case, and that's uh, uh, it happened quite recently. That was on the seventh of October, twenty twenty, when Hurricane Delta entered the polygon. It registered a, a wind speed which was slightly over one hundred uh, knots inside the polygon, and that triggered a payout of um, eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So basically, that's the forty percent that I was mentioning of the $2.2 million, which was the maximum payout uh, to be provided in that case. And that will be invested in uh, large scale restoration efforts over the next uh, two to three years. So the restoration is really happening now. Huh? There are 80 uh, local residents who serve as uh, first responders. These people have been uh, organized, trained and equipped. They are called the Reef Brigades and they conduct all the post-storm response in Cancun 
Contoy Island, Isla Mujeres, and Puerto Morelos. The brigades managed the debris removal, the repair, the loose colony, and the broken fragments. It collects also um, the pieces and uh, established nurseries for future transplants. So as you can see, it's very quick because there's no loss adjuster. There's a parameter, it's uh, transparent, and uh, um, the payout factors are established. Um, I'd like to uh, just conclude, as I see Luca appearing. Uh, uh, so basically, what do we see? We see that this kind of solution, and it's only one among others, uh, removes the volatility and increases the cash flow stability, which brings planning certainty, an important element for investors. It strengthens the local disaster risk management with a financing solution that enables rapid response. We've seen that we took a holistic approach towards also the involvement of the communities, and it expands the frontier of insurability, because um, it's very difficult for an insurer to just like go on site and be able to uh, count, for instance, the number of debris. So this is a very like easier way to do it, and this is where lies also the financial innovation. So what have we seen together in this example? First, the nature of value is recognized for its service. So in uh, investor stamps, that, uh, that's the asset component. Second, the parametric insurance could be used to remove the volatility. Uh, third, it strengthened the resilience and it innovates through the use of technology because we looked at uh, different types of uh, ways to measure the wind. And uh, it could be applied to um, to assets that appear difficult to insure under traditional standards. So these are solutions available to make the green project happen, uh, even if they are not always mainstream. We need, uh, as we know, greener infrastructures in times of climate change and biodiversity crisis. I think that this is a good example, and to me, it's also our responsibility uh, to make it happen. And I would like to quote a, a sentence from by Kennedy. He said, if not us, who? Uh, if not now, when? And uh, we all have this responsibility to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for uh, concluding our, our presentation with this very inspiring quote, very inspiring workshop concluded by an inspiring quote. Um, and I'm also very good to see that our, our technical expertise can be used uh, also for you to, to make some financial assessment. I, I, I'd like to come back to that in the discussion. Um, and with that, um, we succeeded to reserve a, a good amount of time for uh, for discussion. We have about half an hour remaining. Um, and thank you for the question I see coming in. Um, I'm I'm going to be using uh, some of them to to interact with our panelists. I'd like to invite all the panelists back to to the um, with the webcam. And I think Gordon is also here without a welcome. We, we should not forget about you, even if we don't see you. <laughs> and um, and I, I, I do want to thank you all again um, for listening and for presenting. I really thought it was a very inspiring session and, and very much connected uh, with, um, with each other. Before, before I forget, I see the slide uh, coming up with the um, with our contact, you don't have to write it down. What we are going to do, uh, we are going to, we are recording this we are gonna, webinar and we are also going to put a small we also, uh, with uh, the uh, bios of the speaker and the abstracts. And this will may, be made available soon after the workshop in a, in a week or two on the uh, Navigating Climate Change website, PNC. Um, so to start the discussion and to uh, combine the themes of this uh, of this webinar with uh, some of the comments that came in during the during the session, I'd like to 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 ask you, panelists. Um, so how climate change? So we start with this climate change in uh, as 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 title of the of our webinar. Uh, how climate change is improving or not or influencing <laughs> business case? And finance of nature-based solution for uh, water and transport infrastructure. So, is it, does it have an influence, and how can we see that? How can we use that? And also, uh, from the audience, uh, what is the cost of uh, of doing nothing actually, of not taking actions? So, who wants to 
to take a first shot of that? I'll, I'll go first. Right. So I, I guess, like I said, a, a sort of key driver for our um, initiative was those, those two coaching I'm um, getting feedback. Someone needs to mute. Um, yeah, so there's two major flood events, which which could could largely be attributed to to climate change. Like that's sort of unprecedented for the Brisbane River. We did have a major flood in 1976, but um, those two flood events were over one in 100 year events uh, over the period of two years. So that was certainly um, climate change driving um, what we did. Um, and in terms of the the financial question, um, while our focus was purely around that um, sediment slash nutrient reduction requirement, um, we're certainly now starting to look at um, some of the, the, the carbon benefits as well because we're, we're putting in a lot of trees um, in the projects into that bank stabilisation. So we're, we're creating a sort of carbon bank as well. And, and obviously carbon um, emissions reductions is, is becoming a huge thing for us. So, so we're looking at the potential as well as using um, these projects that, that we are delivering um, for carbon banks and, and helping us save money that we would otherwise have to spend through um, carbon reduction initiatives. Um, from yeah, our side, Luke, and from the Gladstone again, a report scenario. Um, I suppose that the uh, looking at the models for sea level rise is uh, something we've considered when you're looking at the sea walls are we going to need to protect a, our land that isn't the um the births and the wars we're a, a landlord in our part of the world of significant tracts of land that might be salt marsh and such like now but in a few years how do you defend and protect them as they become intertidal yeah so so you do you do see a concrete influence of, of climate change and you need to take into account for that, and you are doing that indeed. So th there's really, there's really pressing urgency that you as a port face looks like. Yeah, and certainly the, the mangroves using nature instead of rock to protect some of the assets and, and how that can blend in, and, and especially looking at, um, comes into the, the dollars, what is the most suitable way to protect some of the land as we, we come with these precious um, the beach nourishment is something we've looked at for different reasons, but in this particular context, it was yeah the biodiversity. Yeah. So before I give you the words of being said, so if I if I understand correctly, indeed that you use climate change is is helping uh, to to do things differently, and you are looking also in more nature based solutions to 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 carry out your projects. So so I think that's in a way good news, even if climate change is not good news, but the solution are getting implemented uh, as, I, as I take it. So, so Sabina, sorry, I interrupt you a couple of times, but uh, please, please go ahead. No, that's, that's quite all right. There's always a delay here, so it's hard not to interrupt. I mean, it feels rather perverse to talk about climate change helping anything, but I think, I mean, from the viewpoint of somebody that's really talked about conceptual tools, ecosystem service, thinking and assessment allows us to provide a framing that lets us in as as we cannot maintain the status quo it allows us to envision the future we want to protect and preserve so it allows us to evaluate how we want to manage our land and waterscapes considering the interactions now and into the future and it's it's one way that we can ensure that we're going to be resilient and sustainable and not just reactive. So obviously, um, uh, if we don't want to just be running behind all the time, this sort of framing really helps us think about the futures we want to project and how we do that with all stakeholders. And finance, of course, is part of that, but I'm not going to presume to speak for the financial people. Aria, oh, I, you wanted to add something, indeed. Yes, I, I'd be happy to chip in uh, here. 
Um, perhaps more indirectly, uh, climate change is definitely changing uh, the uh, regulations and the uh, frameworks from the uh, financial institutions. So the rules of the market are, uh, are changing, which is actually driving uh, appetites to invest in those uh, uh, projects. Um, then again, still huh, they have to find a return on investments, but for instance, by uh, the uh, carbon sequestration markets, but also habitat banking and that kind of uh, markets, uh, this is uh, pushed uh, as well. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to emphasize the importance of the value capturing instruments. Yeah? So we have to think about it in a broader sense. Yeah? There is all kind of value in uh, uh, the sustainable uh, measures, but it's about how you uh, convert this into uh, revenue streams. And particularly for climate change, uh, there's also a lot of, a lot of talk about uh, uh, avoided cost in the future, but that's not a revenue stream yet. So there we have to be innovative and, and try to bend this from avoided cost towards actually something you can invest in. Yeah, please, please call him. I think you're mute. I would agree with everything everyone said. I would only add uh, that I suppose public perception is going to be crucial now, um, uh, and and how people see the changes and and it and and how they they recognise the urgency of the situation. Um, I mean, in, in in my case, I was talking about beneficially using sediments on, on marshes, and, and and that's that's great. And 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 if we can do it in large quantities, then then maybe we can do some really phenomenal stuff, and we can hold on to our marshes for longer. But we know that the sea level rise is threatening to to, to wipe out some of these marshes really quite quickly. Um, and we also know that that beneficial use on its own, it, 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 it will not do it. We're going to have to move our sea walls back. We're going to have to do a lot more. Um, but equally, I think I think it's beholden on us to be showing every effort to protect the marshes we've got to buy ourselves some time, and not just saying to people, uh, "Yeah, we're going to move your seawall back, uh, and that's that's all." We should, we just give we're just giving up. I think we should show a degree of fight and a degree of collaboration with local people, recognizing that they must be seeing understanding climate change issues, and and ultimately, you know. You, getting them to buy into it financially and emotionally into the process of changing at the coast. Yeah, indeed. Uh, indeed, public perception and, and getting getting all in the same direction, also very important. Um, Can I add uh, something? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, to the question of uh, how how uh, climate change is influencing the business, actually, if you if you read the Financial Times, uh, which is like the Bible of the business, there is now a section which is on natural capital. Like, look at it, it's, 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 really, uh, it's really interesting uh, because it, it shows the real, the radical shift which is happening in the financial community about it. And if you go to any kind of, uh, of uh, seminar conferences now these days, um, what used to be uh, really a nice to, a kind of uh, nice to have a conversation about about ESG is becoming critical. So basically, investors are not considering um, a port, um, project or portfolio of projects if there is not a very strong ESG component into it. And now, to give you an example, I mean, the, uh, for instance, the European Investment Bank, but also the EBRD, the FOMO, the development banks, the Asian development banks, they are all looking at that, all of them. And we're talking about big money. For instance, in the case of EIB, they have one trillion of assets under, I mean, to, to of uh, under management, and they they need to invest. The European Investment uh, Plan, the Green Deal, is 750 billion. And if you look at their strategy for the next five years, how they call themselves now is the Climate Bank. They don't call any more uh, in, uh, themselves anymore the Development Bank. They call themselves the uh, the Climate Bank. And a lot of their money is going to be allocated to projects that take into consideration climate. They also look at it from a, um, a quantitative uh, um, um, aspect. So they really uh, want to understand what are the benefits. And I would say that the next layer which is going to come, we didn't talk so much about it, but it's about nature. It's the biodiversity uh, crisis, which is more and more taking into account also into financial considerations.
Yeah, thank you, Erika. This, this, this seems uh, very compelling to me again. Um, maybe I, I'd like to use this as, as the bridge to to the other uh, topic that I I try to put immediately at the table because um, um, and and we could uh, use last ten minutes on of the of this workshop to talk about that because um, uh, the, the, the key question is then uh, uh, also from what said so so what's been said so far it's also a bit of an unfair question for uh, the nice application we've seen today so we are not starting from scratch but the question is how do we go from nice inspiring workshops to real uh, projects or to real programs uh, to implementation uh, we are doing this workshop because we want to learn from each other, but because we want to use this opportunity and to get stuff done. So, a, a someone who someone who wants to 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 have a project needs tenders who requires that. Someone who has a program needs to be needs to be uh, driven to like like Eric you just said to to perform in a certain way. Um, I really would like to uh, to try to reflect a little bit. Um, on how, and you showed already, yeah, it's a bit of unfair, so it's the good news is now we're we are not starting now, but how do we make sure that this is not a, a new thing, but it's it's the norm? What what do we need to do to get working with that? Uh, Peter, yeah, you're mute again. Classical of, of webinars uh, nowadays. I'm very sorry. I think this is a critical question, uh, Luca. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about nature based solutions in the global arena in relation to the conventions amongst investors. Uh, there's also quite a few blockages that we come across, including getting investable business cases. I think it's pretty clear that there is a very strong societal business case for adopting nature based solutions alongside infrastructure development. but the returns go to all kinds of stakeholders in society and not necessarily to one investing party. And it's not always very easy to overcome that. At the same time, I think also in developing countries, for example, there is an increased realization that uh, when it comes to governments, for example, investing in infrastructure, often there is a limited availability of resources and then investing in natural capital, restoring natural capital can actually be quite a cost effective solution. I think what really helps to get nature-based solutions from the conceptual discussion to the ground is, is for consortia of organizations from the public and private domain to start implementing pilots on the ground while doing the implementation involving government partners, um, regulators and others so that they kind of co-own these pilot projects and then through that stimulate them to adopt them in, in the mainstream business. As some of you might be aware, in the last 10 years, uh, the EcoShape Building with Nature program has been implementing, mostly focusing on cases in the Netherlands. And what 10 years of experimenting all kinds of pilot projects has shown is that where those pilot projects, driven by civil society, academia and private sector, engage those that in the end are the decision makers uh, on investments um, and, and plans for infrastructure development, where that engagement is in place, actually it is actually it's possible to reach the mainstream so there's quite a lot of lessons learned on on how pilot projects can be a trigger to ensuring that investors and regulators adopt this approach at scale and i think we should learn from those lessons and apply them at a bigger scale across the world yeah thank you peter some someone else wants to wants to pitch in on this that's Sabina, thank you, uh, and Arjen. Uh, okay. don't, don't wait for me, you can All right. just go ahead. All right, <laughs> I just wanted to jump in. I mean, I, what everything Peter said was right. I, I'm just, again, going to make a pitch for ecosystem framing tools as a bridge between all those partners and a communication tool to help answer the so what and what's in it for me question and provide a platform for different stakeholders and regional projects and objectives to see how projects affect their needs and how this is all interrelated and help build the business case as well because as we identify ecosystem service costs and benefits that helps frame then the financial costs and the social costs and benefits. So, 
Luca, it's Gordon here. Some of our challenges uh, end up being less financial and more getting the regulators on the journey. I think uh, Colin and certainly Craig of her would would um, know this is sound similar in the in the UK as well as uh, elsewhere in Australia. We have um, old legislation in various places, which where I talked about the policy review that, that hold, holds the regulators back from being able to be on some of those journeys. So being able to get some, um, some robust science in front of them is one of our challenges because a pilot project in our legislation is the same as a full project uh, when it comes to getting an approval. So having a, you know, a small amount of sediment placed somewhere for beneficial reuse compared to lots has no difference when it comes to the regulatory environment at the moment. So it's uh, it's uh, more getting approval through the the regulatory hurdles than uh, necessarily sometimes getting the finance. Maybe maybe uh, yeah. just just um, to answer to that quickly. Um, um, I think uh, I think what you say, Gordon, is true more or less everywhere. Uh, but what I do see here, uh, I guess. Um, as, as what Peter already mentioned, um, is that in um, in a pilot of in an iconic demonstration project, uh, there's a will to try new things. Does not mean that we can do things that are against the regulation, but there's there's ways to bring research or innovation or or research. I mean, not only technical but governance, finance as well. <laughs> to uh to prove that and i think there is the will of doing that from a different parties including government and authorities is really important uh the, the, the will to trigger that so i want to i want to also mention that because if we want to do it maybe it's a small scale it's not that we can do something that we can never do something that's not allowed but we can try things if we do it very carefully and, and and in a in a in a in the right way. Uh, sorry, Arion, I I I think I interrupt you again. No, 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 no. Thanks. Uh, well, I, I'd like to mention uh, three things: how to scale this up in uh, reality. Uh, first of all, there's quite often a good economic base for these kind of sustainable measures, but it's very difficult, uh, hard to make it actually also a, a profitable uh, financial case. And in that sense, you know, we have to focus on all kinds of innovative financial solutions, value capturing arrangements, like for instance, Eric uh, uh, showed, uh, but I also uh, noticed quite a few others in the presentations. So that's one, going from the economic uh, case to a profitable financial uh, case. Secondly, certification, showing or guaranteeing that the project is actually green. Uh, nobody wants to jump in and, and have all kind of reputational damage because well, it was said to be green, but in reality, it's uh, shown to be a little bit different. So that's something that has to be uh, uh, driven uh, or, or, or get accomplished uh, as well. And third, as uh, uh, Colin also mentioned, I think uh, communication is also key. Uh, I uh, Recently, I heard the mentioning of uh, the general public being sea blind or coastal blind. Everybody knows about windmills and solar parks, etc. But uh, a green marine waterborne infrastructure it's so out of sight so it's not very commonplace and we also notice in, in discussions with all kind of uh, financial institutions it's they're very unfamiliar with it so uh, we we meet each other in these kind of communities but uh, uh, reaching out to the financial sector is really important as well as well as to the general public i would say well i'll leave it to that And then maybe um, I, I'd like to follow up with a question because I, I, I noted during during Eric's presentation, um, what, does, what do you mean by reaching out? Because what I, the good news that I saw from Eric's presentation is that Eric's was using a lot of uh, 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 results that technical uh, expert, experts can provide. Um, and I'm thinking that maybe we should do it more often to, to, to reach out because that is really a a way to implement that because an area could use that to make compelling uh, uh, your point one from economics to financially profit i wrote those down um and and vice versa so so what do you think eric maybe what do you think about about that well i think that um 
Uh, Ian, when he mentioned about the green certification, is a, um, has a, a valid uh, a valid point. So basically, if you want to scale up, you need to have a certain amount of standardization. And uh, as um, uh, Sabine, but also Colin, Peter mentioned, it's you know you scale up by addressing the different dimensions. Uh, the policy dimension is for me also very fundamental. There are works which is being done at the, at the, at the very high level. Nature-based solutions have been mentioned by the G, uh, G7 uh, or G20 summit uh, very recently. Um, OECD has launched uh, um, uh, one report on nature-based solutions, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, but when it comes to, yes, the quantitative approach, uh, I was absolutely fascinated by the, the, the presentation by Craig as well to see all the work that has been done. And because this is real financial value that, that uh, he, the, the, they produced to the community. So when we're talking about investors, uh, Ayan mentioned that there's the private equity, but on the, to the other scope, there's the public finance. A lot of these, um, um, these projects will be done by governments independently and in the meantime in the between you you can have all sorts of shades of, of gray or green let's put it like that but uh, but basically uh, you um, bringing the quantitative uh, to to and that links to Sabine to have a holistic to go out of the silo um, is uh, of a paramount importance and and we uh, for instance within within Swiss Re, and when the, the job and i think that if we go back into like also the creation of uh, like those projects all of that is about when when you create a project whatever it is it's it's about also the risk quantification and the allocations of risks to the different stakeholders and for that uh, you, you definitely need to have uh, uh, science backing you into uh, to and and understanding of the, the different like uh, data patterns to be able to 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 measure and to to allocate those risks to the different stakeholders. Indeed, um, I think we are about we are about uh, one one minute before the end of the of this uh, of this uh, workshop. Uh, unfortunately, I think we we have to conclude soon. Uh, before the last before the last word, I, I also want to mention that um, we are going to try to save and answer the questions that are coming in that we're not we're not able to to answer during the discussion. I give the opportunity to want to put you on the spot, but they give the opportunity to f for any of you to say uh, some final word or a final quote. This workshop turned out to be um, um, giving some inspiring. Uh, keywords so so who wants to who wants to take the opportunity to to do some final quote before before we conclude well i'd like to say very quickly that uh, we, we're all there to push for a greener world so let's keep going thank you eric i'd say with that uh, uh we, we would leave it there um thank you again uh, to the speaker. Thank you for putting the time to prepare this wonderful workshop today and yesterday. Thank you for following at different time zones. Some of you stayed up late, some of you uh, woke up early. Uh, it was great and, um, and we, we, we need to continue and, and on, this, on this road that we, 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 are, we are walking together. So thank you again. And with this, I'd like to, to close.